All right, everyone, thank you so much. We now have our panel of experts from the Weisman Center. Lindsay McCary, our psychologist, Amy Lyle, one of our social workers, and Maria Stanley, our physician in the Down Syndrome Clinic. And I'm Robin Valley Massey. I'm the clinic manager for the Weisman Center Clinics and the Autism Treatment Program. So we do have a question, and I invite people to ask questions, um, but one of the questions we received is, what is known about starting a preventative medication like Namenda at an early age, like five to 10 years in individuals with Down syndrome to prevent Alzheimer's? So I, I'll take that question, and um, I will um, say that I, I can't tell you that I've, I, I know exhaustive uh, exhaustively about the research, but I can tell you what I do know, um, which is that um, several years ago, th there's for a long time there's been excitement about that compound memantine um, in mouse models, and there's a researcher named Alberto Costa that's been really involved in, with that compound, um, who was initially in Colorado and is now at Case Western Reserve University, um, and continues to study the potential role of that compound because, again, in the mouse models, there there has been some exciting um, progress seen. Um, what, several years ago, there was a study, um, uh, I believe it was called the Meadows Study, um, that was a larger study looking at adults who were um, who had Down syndrome and monitoring um, from an age where they were not showing any cognitive um, challenges uh, to see whether that medication might be helpful in um, preventing or delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, that study was stopped early um, because the people in the control group uh, as a group did better than the people that were in the treatment group. Um, and so, um, you know, I. I <laughs> It, it just, it's a caution for all of us, and I think it shows the challenges um, as we're looking at translational research, and I think this comes up at about every research conference that I go to, how um, as good as the models that we can make in animals, um, they're never an exact match for humans. And, um, and we had an experience here, too, um, several years ago where we were involved in a clinical trial looking at a medicine that was specifically developed actually for enhancing cognition in people with Down syndrome. And, um, it, it just seemed so exciting because it had been specifically developed looking, targeting um, the challenges that we see in cognition. And it was started in people 18 to 30 years and then moved down into the younger age groups. And ultimately, um, sadly, we found um, no benefit to the use of that medication. And so, um, I, you know, ag again, um, I. I still believe that breakthroughs are coming, and um, and as Brad mentioned, there are some um, exciting clinical trials just on the horizon at looking at um, prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And I so I, it's not that we're not going to get there, but we're not there yet, and um, we don't have the answers yet. Um, I do think, though, that this the question is actually a great opportunity to think about how do people access those new trials and new information that's coming down the pike. And I just want everybody to be aware of three things. One is that we do have a research registry here at the Wasteman Center. And I really encourage anyone um, uh, to think about signing up for that because I think it's really important. You can be, um, we can reach out to you to let you know about studies that are happening here at the Wasteman Center and how you can be involved. There's never any obligation, and so if a study, you're approached about a study and you choose not to participate, that's fine. Um, there's a national effort called um, DS Connect um, that you can access. You can go to their website. It's a wonderful resource. It's really been set up to be a, a housing for information about um, individuals and their health care. It's for children, adults of all ages, um, and, and researchers can connect with that national website that's through the NIH to, um, to request that they reach out to individuals to see if they're interested in participating. And so again, a researcher might say, I'm interested in looking at this new intervention in people in this age group. And if you fall into that age group, they may, somebody may reach out to you to let you know about it. Again, there's no obligation on your part to participate. And researchers are vetted before they're able to um, connect with families through that, that registry. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, um, and, and then the one other thing I was going to mention is if you're wondering, for example, is there a trial right now in Memantine, in with Memantine in Down syndrome, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov, and it shows all the, 
the studies that are happening around the country, what are the eligibility criteria, um, and, and are they recruiting right now? And so there are lots of opportunities out there, um, and if you're interested in participating in research, um, it's, it's so generous when people um, are willing to, to give their time or participate, and there are ways to do that. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so the question was about in dual diagnosis, so Down syndrome and autism, how would that change or impact the educational services? And it may or may not is the short answer to that. So individuals with IEPs, that IEP should be individualized to that child's needs to begin with. Um, <clears throat> what can help with the dual diagnosis or recognition of that is it helps other people understand the needs of that individual so that if they are not already incorporated, social skills or other social aspects might be added to the IEP or um, there might be better recognition of that. It can affect the eligibility category, so instead of intellectual impairment or other health impairment, educational autism could be the eligibility category, but the eligibility category is really just a doorway. It should not have that much of an impact on the actual services, because services should meet the needs of that individual child. And the first question, I think, was regarding lifespan correct between a, an individual with Down syndrome and an individual with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's? And, and I apologize. Um, I'm a pediatrician and um, don't, don't know that, that literature well. Um, I would expect that there may be shortening in the, the lifespan just because Alzheimer's is such a disabling disease and, if, and you know, end stage Alzheimer's affects um, ability to eat and swallow and, and do lots of other important things that people need to do to survive. And so I would expect that it, it could be shorter, but I, I don't know the literature. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, we, we have a question. <laughs> the only other thing I would add um, really quick to the IEP question, and it's just another example, is um, like Nancy brought up earlier, um, sensory concerns. And if that isn't something that's already being addressed in the IEP, that the autism um, lens to look through might add some focus to that and maybe some understanding among staff about why that person might be having some either sensory seeking behaviors or sensitivity or um, might need a little um, help in getting going so be under responsive um, and perhaps that would just help highlight that a little bit more too. That's very interesting because sometimes and I have my kid doesn't have Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think we as clinicians have heard that from families before that sometimes it really does feel that way 
I, I can't speak to how well people are able to access this service, but the way the Medicaid benefit is written currently, um, autism is not required to receive some of those behavioral intervention services. So they've written it to be more broad so it can be available to people with other diagnoses that don't include autism. Again, I can't speak to a family who's actually gone through the process to try to access that, but it is written in such a way so that we can offer services to a greater variety of individuals. I love what you said about like this will make people understand the child better because it's just about understanding. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is written is great and it's beautiful, but when it, we take it to the practices, it's just like they won't understand that part of the behavior. Like, oh, it's just he's just misbehaving. And then they just call mom because they need mom to intervene. Instead of saying, you know, he just has, you know, other issues and sensory issues that, that we, that they can just tweak something and then he will keep learning, you know, better. That's very interesting. Thank you. Go ahead. I have two questions. The first one's pretty simple. The director mentioned that a third of the children that go to the come to the Weissman Center are students with developmental disabilities. What are the other two? How are the other two thirds? Or what role do they play, or how are they selected? It's the preschool. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's uh, the Weissman Early Childhood Program, and it's a uh, um, it's a preschool and child care um, setting and so um, the, the other two-thirds are um, peers who are typically developing and families can apply to um, enroll their children there. Okay. And my second question was, we're a bilingual family and I taught my, my first daughter um, Spanish first. And I just, uh, and I, this might not be your area of language, but um, I'm wondering if given the, we've been, uh, we got a diagnosis for Down syndrome? And I'm wondering if I should teach my child Spanish first, which is what I did and would have done um, had, had he not been diagnosed. But I'm just wondering if you've ever dealt with Spanish speakers and if I'm putting him at a disadvantage by teaching him Spanish first, yeah. even though that's sort of what we speak. We can speak, obviously, we can speak English. But I just yeah. want to call him Liz. Yeah. Liz. <laughs> we wanna, we wanna would you be willing, Liz? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's important that um, as a family, you decide um, what's important for your family and retaining your culture and um, deciding Spanish, possibly your first language, second language um, being English. Um, we know there's advantages of children being in bilingual homes. Um, you just have to, in a way, sort of work that out, but um, you definitely, you know, your child has um, the right to be communicated um, in his or her own language, um, and yeah, yeah, so we, we really encourage families to make that decision. It's okay to have both languages spoken, um, and just making sure that that's also communicated to the professionals who are working with your child. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, the other thing I would encourage you to do is look, there's a website called Down Syndrome Education International, and um, that group is headed up by a woman named Sue Buckley, who is a psychologist who's also a parent um, and has really been a, an amazing advocate um, for appropriate education and care for people with Down syndrome in the UK and she and, and around the world um, and she uh, but but on that website are some really nice resources about bilingualism and Down syndrome and some really helpful information I think I think what Liz said too is it, it does come down to an individual decision and sometimes it comes down to you know who is the child that you have and and if at some point you find that that child is struggling with bilingualism do, do you then choose just a, one primary language and, and work on that first? But I think a lot of families have successfully raised their children bilingual with Down syndrome and, and been happy about that choice. What was the website again? Um, Down, Down Syndrome Education International. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. 
customized through our wonderful pediatrician. Um, one of my questions, and I don't know if other families have this, is when, as far as the range of services and your, you know, opportunities that you offer for children, or, you know, things like our hearing screening and speech and evaluation, all that, when do you typically see children age out of that Down syndrome clinic? How do we make that decision when we're utilizing that time valuably or when it might not be beneficial anymore? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can start, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of when somebody could join the clinic, we typically aren't accepting new patients into the clinic over age 18 at this time. Um, it is, I, it is a goal and a wish and and a, um, a you know a sort of a. a a driving goal, I would say, um, to think about how do we start to provide care for people with, for adults with Down syndrome. Um, in terms of the, I, I um, we do have some flexibility in the clinic right now in terms of um, care for older individuals. I think being a pediatrician in general um, and being a pediatric clinic, our comfort level is really with, you know, kids, people in childhood and not into adulthood, although um, I have done some consultations um, with young adults, um, but but I think that um, ultimately, you know, our hope is that we will be able to provide lifespan care here, and um, we're actively seeking information, which is what Liz part of what Liz is doing to try to understand what are those adult health care needs. And I would just add, typically, the age that we start to look at transition is between 18 and 21. Yes. So eye contact is interesting because it can, the lack of eye contact or more in, intermittent eye contact can be due to a lot of different things. Um, so some kids who have a lot of anxiety or who are inattentive might have limited eye contact or fleeting eye contact, as well as individuals with autism. So when we think about autism, there are thousands of different ways that symptoms can combine to meet that diagnosis. And so eye contact is just one piece of that. Um, so I would say in general that if that's the only behavior that seems different or concerning, then it may not be something to worry as much about. But if there are multiple behaviors, then I think that's when you want to start asking that question. And for older children, I'm speaking for myself as well as a friend with a mm -hmm. teenage daughter. Um, my son is 13. But I was never really concerned with getting an autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. He came to us older. And so I, I wasn't concerned with that because I felt if we could meet his needs, that's all that mattered, mm -hmm. looking at what are his specific needs. Is there any benefit? older individuals with Down syndrome diagnosed with autism if one feels they might be on the spectrum mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, I'll let Dr. Stanley talked to this point as well, but in the literature with individuals with autism without a genetic condition, there is a lot of value in understanding that diagnosis and getting an evaluation when they're older. Not necessarily for treatment services, certainly those could be available if, if they so choose, but to understand um, what their differences are and how that might manifest or affect um, their interactions with other people, there can be some value in that information at an older age. I don't really have much to add. I would say um, I'm not aware of any literature that specifically answers that question for us, but I think that the lens of understanding that the challenges that are unique to that particular individual um, can always be helpful. And I would just add, when we think about employment in future and um, the more um, caregivers outside of the family that might be interacting with older individuals with Down syndrome, that that might also help them better understand the individual if we know that if um, they also have autism, that can go to kind of what Liz was talking about with video modeling and ways that tasks are taught, ways that caregivers are introduced. Um, we know that um, visual learners, you know, that that can be such a strong tool and that if um, autism is sort of on top of that, that that could be incorporated in lots of ways in their adult life. Anyone else? 
I'm wondering, we ha still have a few minutes left, if the panel would mind telling um, us a little bit about what the Down Syndrome Clinic does. Okay, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm the clinic coordinator for the Down Syndrome Clinic. And um, so we see families who have um, kids and youth with, and young adults with Down Syndrome. And um, typically we meet as a team um, twice a month at this point. Um, and on one week we see kids who tend to be under the age of six, and on the other weeks we see older kids. We are a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary clinic, so we have lots of um, team members, which is really wonderful. We value that as clinicians, having each other um, to rely on and inform our experiences and um, recommendations that are made to families. And we, um, I think this, this clinic is so near and dear to all of our hearts because we um, learn so much from families and kids that come to our clinic as well. So we have um, Maria is our, um, Dr. Stanley is our medical director of the Weisman Center, but also our clinic director of Down Syndrome Clinic. I am the clinic coordinator and also the social worker in that clinic. Um, Lindsay, uh, Dr. McCary is the psychologist in that clinic. Uh, Liz Del Sandro is the speech language pathologist. Um, we also have um, physical therapy in that clinic as well, as well as occupational therapy. Um, we have nursing in that clinic. And we all come together and um, we try to reach out to families ahead of their appointment here at Wasteman Center to really hear from you all what your priorities are for that visit. Um, they, it tends to last an entire morning, um, so it's usually um, sort of like an 8.30 to noon, 12.30 experience, so it's, it's quite a long morning, and we definitely want to make sure that families leave with their questions answered and the pri their priorities for the visit um, addressed, so we try to do that. If um, there are ways that we can make um, kids and families more comfortable in clinic, we want to learn that ahead of time, too. We also more recently have been able to add um, a few MD-only appointments or doctor-only only appointments um, to Down Syndrome Clinic with um, Dr. Stanley. And so a lot of times we are seeing um, babies who have graduated from the NICU and those appointments as a way to um, welcome those families and provide some of that post um, NICU developmental monitoring. Um, and then as they, then they would be seen in a team appointment um, later. We have audiology. How could I have forgotten audiology? <laughs> yes. So audiology is a huge, um, a huge part of that appointment too. Yeah. Every kid that get diagnosed with Down syndrome around the Mason, Mason, Wisconsin, County, I don't know how you call it, the area, come to the Weisman Center or not every kid with a diagnosis will come? Definitely not every kid with a diagnosis um, comes. And we wish that our capacity was such that that could be the case. We would love to see every family who has a child or youth with Down syndrome. And our challenge right now is capacity. We don't currently have the resources to see families as often as we would like. And there is a wait to get into clinic and um, we are working on that and problem solving around that. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add to um, the, the gate the gate into the clinic is definitely a referral from your primary care doctor. And so, you know, I, it, it, the other kids that we're not seeing, it's not because we have screened them out of clinic or declined to see them. It's because they, they, we haven't, they haven't been referred to our clinic. And so that's the way to get in. There are also some challenges with insurance as well. So um, you can always call and speak to me if you're concerned about that. Yeah, yeah. OK, great. All right, well, I, we're almost at time, so I think we'll wrap up, and thank you to our panel. We got every we got enough space. Yep. Oh, we did. Yeah, we got enough.
Do you want me to come up there? Okay. Ah, sure. So, <clears throat> we're going to transition to our community panel. One of the, the ways that makes the days like this possible is through our partnerships with community organizations. And this year, um, we're delighted that it's our ninth year doing this in partnership with the Madison Area Down Syndrome Society. And this year, too, our additional partner is Gigi's Playhouse. So we're grateful for the opportunity to work collaboratively on this event and in so many other ways. Um, our moderator today is Joe Bridges. He's the president of MADS. So I'm going to let him take it from here. But let's give our panelists a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, like Teresa said, this is one of the highlights of the year for us at the Madison Area Down Syndrome Society. Uh, and on behalf of MADS and on behalf of our co-sponsor for the event, Gigi's Playhouse, we want to thank uh, the Weissman Center for not only putting this event on, but for uh, everything they do for the Down Syndrome and Disability community generally here in Madison. Um, so just a little bit of background on myself, and then uh, we'll move on to introducing our panelists and uh, getting, getting them to tell you a little bit about themselves and why they're here today. Uh, so I've been the president of MADS for a year and three months now. Joined the board in 2015 after my daughter Kennedy was born. Uh, Kennedy is a vivacious firecracker of a three-year-old who also happens to have Down syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. And she is the, the reason why we're here today. So the, or the reason why I'm here today, I should say. Uh, by day, I'm a senior litigation attorney with the law firm of Michael Best. I'm also active in the Down Syndrome community at the national level with the National Down Syndrome Society through their uh, ambassador program. In fact, I was just in D.C. this week uh, lobbying for legislation that could have a positive impact on individuals with Down Syndrome and their families. So uh, with that, let's get to who we're really here to talk to and about today, our panelists. Uh, and I'd like everyone to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And we'll start with uh, Caitlin Wittish. Caitlin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm 24. I live in my own apartment, and I am a cheer competitor. And Caitlin, you also have three jobs, right? Yes. Can you tell us where you work? I work at DUR, it's Department of Revenue, and I work. The second job is Longwings. And my third one is Mod Pizza. If you go there, they have very special pizza there. <laughs> <laughs> and Caitlin is, of course, being modest, uh, especially with regards to her job at the Department of Revenue, where she does uh, inventory management, but also data entry and records management. Uh, so really important and, frankly, intimidating work, uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Caitlin, thank you for being here. Sadler, can you give us a brief introduction, please? Yeah, it's all about now it's a world tie while you bad your fans. <laughs> I am from Alabama originally, that's why I said that. I'm actually 35 years old. I just had a birthday, a Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I actually moved here from Alabama when I was only 19, and I've been living on my own ever since then. Uh, when I first got here, my sister was going to UW as a grad student, actually, and uh, I was a senior in high school, and we all know how it is when you're a senior and you're about to go to college. So I actually called my sister and said I pretty much got everything I could here in Alabama. So I told her I needed to move up here and make a change. So it was really hard for me to actually say goodbye to my family, my friends, especially my mom. Because I know there are a lot of moms here, and I know that if you have a child with a, dis with a, with a disability, especially with Down syndrome even, it is still hard to say goodbye to them when they leave the nest. <laughs> and Sadler, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your what you do professionally, where you work? I actually work for the DOA, Department of Administration, as a mailroom clerk. I basically meet a mail. I actually get Caitlin's mail, actually. I actually do get her mail. <laughs> mm. 
from her job. And I also have a seasonal job that I do uh, for the Dean of Justice office uh, downtown, actually, uh, doing building as well. And actually, I'm working on a project where I want to have my own nonprofit to teach old people with disabilities to actually learn how to live independently. <laughs> but it will be a couple of years because, like I said, I'm just starting out. <laughs> Thanks, Sadler. And then uh, also joining our panel today, we have uh, Susan Moore. Susan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, I'm here as a grandmother. That's my <laughs> claim to fame. I am a registered nurse. Um, been a nurse for quite a few years. Um, but I have a beautiful, actually two beautiful, uh, five-year-old grandson and Jacob, uh, two-and-a-half-year-old grandson with Down syndrome. Um, and I'm here as a grandparent. And we're really excited to have that grandparent perspective because I know it's been a number of years since we've had a grandparent on the panel. So thank you for joining us, Susan. Uh, also, Caroline Skalski. Caroline, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Caroline Skalski, and um, I have a daughter who is 16 with Down syndrome. Her name is Isabella, who is um, active at Gigi's Playhouse loves Gigi's, would tell me it's her second home. Um, and she has been homeschooled all through her schooling <coughs> years. And so by day, I'm a homeschool mom. And I live in just south of Oregon. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and then our last panelist joining us today is Amy Ulrich. Amy, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm the sibling of the crew. So um, I have a brother, Chris, who um, is nine years younger than me and um, lives in Madison. And Chris and I live together. Um, after our parents passed away, I moved back to Madison from Colorado and assumed um, guardianship and caregiving duties. Um, and I work also full time for the Department of Justice. So you also do my mail. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and I know how it feels also actually to have a sibling that also worked with people with disabilities. And you might not see my shirt. It's one of my visions, Love Dane, L-O-V Dane. It's actually an organization for all people with disabilities. And my sister uh, was one of the members that actually first started it. And it is actually was one of the also a part of the Vice Center as well. So if you want to check out Lightbrain, it's Lightbrain.org. Uh, it's for all people with disabilities. It's family based. And we don't judge no matter if you are Catholic or Jewish or anything like that. We don't judge people in, in that kind of thing. And Sadler just very helpfully answered the first question we had from the community, which is why he moved to Madison specifically. Uh, and he came here to work with Love Dane and uh, work with his sister, who was one of the founding members. Well, it took a while for Love Dane to get started at first, but <laughs> yes. And uh, so I, the first official question I think we're going to uh, have is for Caitlin and Sadler. And I think we'll start with Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin. What is it like, and could you please tell the, the group uh, what, it, what it's like living alone in your own apartment and what you really appreciate and like about that? I live in my own apartment because you do more chores at home when you have really hard chores like laundry and dishes. Um, when you have more harder, more chores, you have to get we get done a lot of laundry done you get a next one and another one done now it's you get free time if you do free time yeah and Sadler same question for you what uh, what's it like to live independently and can you tell us a little bit about your roommates and how that goes well I mean no no thanks to the mothers I actually loved when I left the, the most I was just the only one in my family that was just looking more forward to it. But uh, for me, it's, I just love being on my own. The two guys that I do live with, uh, one guy in my basement, he actually worked at a cheese 
cake back there if you want cheesecake. <laughs> and the other guy, uh, he's there for a few more weeks uh, before he goes. Uh, he, he's actually a software engineer for a lane zoomed. And uh, now we're going to have a quick question here. Carolyn, I, I'm interested because I know uh, you homeschool your children and have homeschooled your daughter, Isabella, who has Down syndrome. Uh, based on that experience and uh, kind of what you've learned, what is one thing that you'd like to tell teachers and schools uh, in the public <laughs> system or the private system about having a child with Down syndrome in the classroom? I would want to tell everyone to always be able to step outside the box. Don't, no child with Down syndrome that, who I've ever met is the same. None of them are the same. And even with my own experience with my six children at home, and they range in age from 24 to 11, so I'm still homeschooling three of them, they all have needed something different. There's no, not one program that fits every child, whether they have a disability or no disability. I agree with that, because my parents do that from both me, my brother, and my sister. And I have the easiest one. <laughs> <laughs> so be willing, be willing to step outside the box. Be willing to look at something from a different angle. And don't hesitate to be the person who advocates for your child and says, no, this isn't working. We need to find something different. That's. I have a question for you, very nice to meet you. Uh, sure. Um, recently, in January, um, I start, we start um, having my son having online education at home. It's not homeschooling because it's not us. Sure. Because he was having numerous issues at this school, and, and then he went to a specialized school that was even worse. Um, and how did you handle the social part of, of being at, at a typical school than being at home? Okay, well, a few things. W one is Isabella is the fourth in six children, so there's a lot of kids at my house. And I mean, just by, you know, by chance, I guess. Um, so, so the social aspect for her, I mean, she always had kids around all day, every day. We also belong to a homeschool group that has more than 100 families. So we, and we get together very frequently and would go on field trips together, just like schools take field trips to many of the same places. I mean, so we do a lot of that. But also, the other way I deal with socialization is I go to the park. I get my kids involved in the community. I'm at the library. I, go, I take my kids to story time. You, you know, just all, all the things you would normally do in a day. I mean, we go to the library during the school day. We talk to people. I, I just, I, you know, I don't isolate my kids. They're in sports, they're in, you know, we're in the community. Um, f for, yes, for ours, yes. And there's a lot of homeschooling, and I can talk to you afterwards, there's a lot of homeschooling resources in the Madison area. There are. Sure. So this question is for Amy. How did your family plan for your eventual mm -hmm. role as a caregiver? Or what, what steps did your parents take? Um, they did not plan, and they took no steps. <laughs> so, um, Do you have any recommendations? yeah, I have quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, where would you like me to start? Um, so, my my um, my father died very unexpectedly of a heart attack in the backyard of our home. Um, after dropping my brother off at work um, and I knew then I knew when I was in high school that this would be my role and what I can say to parents is if you have a sibling who expresses an interest in being a caregiver don't push it off 
it's real and any sibling will tell you this that if they have an interest I'm, I'm part of many sibling groups if and there are many siblings who have a strong desire to take on the role of a caregiver um, when the time comes and my parents I, and I expressed that repeatedly but my parents um, kept pushing it away they didn't want to talk about it they didn't want to think about it they didn't want to plan for it um, maybe a state of denial I'm not sure what but if you have a sibling who expresses that honor that um, we're not kidding we want to take on this role I love the role that I that I'm in right now um, it's one that I that I've always known that I was going to play um, but what would have been helpful is if they had helped me plan for it um, things like coming up with uh, a care plan coming up with understanding why Chris does things the way that he does them um, I had two years after my father died to establish guardianship because they had never even done guardianship for him he had no guardian and he was 37 um, and he had no formal guardianship we had nothing Social Security banking it was pure crisis when when dad died um, Social Security cut off his payments immediately when my father died um, so we were in a, a state of crisis um, there was there was no special needs trust for him there was no plan so I spent you know two and a half years working with lawyers um, getting guardianship established um, and coming up with a plan there was no housing for him he doesn't live he doesn't live by himself he lives with me and that's because none of that was done prior for him so um, a lot of siblings do find themselves sort of in a state of crisis after after the parents cannot care for them anymore and um, if there's anything you can do to help your siblings or whoever you want um, in the future to care for this individual <laughs> Do it well in advance. It just makes things so much easier for everyone. I want to add to that, actually, because uh, for me, I was lucky, actually. My dad actually worked for a lot of banks growing up when I was a kid. So he has helped me and my sister has helped me with my money. And my brother, he actually turned himself completely from one side of the, of the tracks to the other from having problems with drug and alcohol, from having that and overcoming it and becoming a counselor to helping others to not be, not make the mistakes that he made. And my mom actually was a retired physical therapist, actually, and they always helped me. Actually, in Alabama, they don't have, they have segregated classrooms, basically back in the 90s, I'm not sure how it now, you know, but back then, all, no matter how old you were, they were one class just for the people with disabilities, even with like Stone syndrome or autism. And I didn't want that, so my dad was the first person ever to advocate for me. He went to all the board meetings and says, my son has Down syndrome, and you better be ready for him. <laughs> Same thing like me. Um, my, my uncle passed away. Um, he was for me too, though, so he lives in Arizona. And his name is Charles. And I don't know what happened to him, but I know he support me. My aunt name's Aunt Shelly. She support me also too when, when I go down there. They support me down there when, when I have um, disability, they will help me with um, cooking skills and different stuff also, yeah. And do we have a question over there? Yeah. My understanding is that there's different levels of guardianship. There's some newer yeah. things that some more self-directed guardianship. But Chris is very cognitively affected by Down syndrome. He has probably the IQ of a, a 
three year old um, and he's 41. He needs extensive care, but he's also incredibly social and can be manipulated very easily. Um, so the, the guardianship became an issue, um, especially around issues around banking. Um, my, fa my father was a very social guy and everything kind of of their generation was a wink and a handshake and they just made it work that way. Um, but when he died, um, the banks would not, you know, we couldn't, Social Security was like, where's the paperwork proving that you can, proving that my mother could um, become his rep payee for his Social Security payments. Where's, where's his separate bank account, you know? times have changed. Everything's got to be documented. Everything's got to be in writing. And uh, we couldn't even talk to his doctors, you know, um, because we just didn't have anything. We had nothing. Whereas my father kind of worked on it. So the guardianship has really helped um, just, you know, sm smooth everything for us whenever we had to do anything legal or banking related. I would, I'm actually my own guardian. Yeah, he actually. Was, yeah. And my sister actually has helped me with money. My dad with money. My family is really allocate. And if you have like another sister of a having a brother as well, like my sister does, with a dis with Down syndrome, it's basically like, what, do you want to give up on a family member? Hell no. It's family. We have uh, another question in the, towards the back there. Just a tiny uh, addition. Um, there is going to be a presentation on March 21st hosted by Love Dane, which is going to cover some of the alternatives to guardianship, like um, supported decision making, use of powers of attorney. Um, if you can go to the Love Dane, L O V Dane website and look that up. That's right, Dane Dog. It's L O V Dane dot org. Yeah, L O V Dane dot org is the website. And uh, it's going to be at night, and it's going to be at um, the it's a, a church that's just off of um, um, I can't remember the name of the street. It's Orchard Ridge. Orchard Ridge. Nice. And we also uh, Mads also does every couple of years, and we're looking to do it again this year because it's been a few now we do a financial planning and special needs trust seminar that's always been really successful i know i went after my daughter was born and it was super super helpful in getting us on the right track uh, so just keep a lookout i mean we're really fortunate to live in madison and in the community that has a lot of these resources at your fingertips if you just look i think carolyn you wanted to add something i just wanted to say that i also have a brother who has a cognitive disability and i would tell you that when Amy says that her, her brother Chris could be taken advantage, advantage of monetarily, my, my brother has been by friends, you know, supposed friends. So I think that is something to really um, just be aware of, realize it, and make sure you take steps to protect them. Yes, and that's one of the spies my sister actually started Lord Bain because of me. <laughs> and people like Caitlin, you know, we have. We have a disability, but there's a t-shirt I have. I don't have it on me, but it's called Later Jaws, Not People. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so I want to shift a little bit to talk with Susan for a minute about her perspective as a grandparent. Um, and Susan, I guess I would just start with, I know when my daughter was born, uh, my parents and my wife's parents struggled a little bit with how to process the diagnosis in a way that gave us some space but also that kind of uh, you know recognized what an impact it was going to have on our lives and and what we often hear I think in our community is that grandparents aren't really sure how to react or you know do I treat the child with Down syndrome differently than my other grandchildren how do we deal with this as a family so I guess you know what was your experience and do you have any advice for grandparents who are uh, dealing with a new Down syndrome diagnosis in the family that's a great question because, you know, being a nurse, you have just enough knowledge to you know, be scared. Uh, my daughter is a physician. She had even more knowledge to be even more scared. So we <laughs> sort of navigated together. I mean, the, the positive side is that you can navigate the medical system, the hospital. I mean, I do have, you know, a little bit of knowledge of how it works and, um, you know, how to communicate with caregivers a little better. They do... Um, 
um, so, so, so that's a piece. But the, the bigger question, I guess, is that first reaction, you know, and, uh, you know, it's hard. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's something that you don't expect, but it's, a, it's your family and you're just going to show support and love. That's, that's all you can do. Right? And, yeah. Well said. That, that is great. I just want to make one other additional comment because I do feel like that with the medical complications that go along in that first, you know, six months or so, we can get completely wrapped up, or I got completely wrapped up in the medical component of it, um, and so I pushed all those feelings back, and so then six months later, then I'm dealing with what you're talking about. And, and you're right, I mean, and that's probably the nurse in me going, oh, I can fix this, you know. Um, but, but then six months later, I'm dealing with all of those, and I, I applaud you for saying it so eloquently because that's, well, it sounds like it came from my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Susan, what, uh, in addition to the love and support that we were just talking about, what have you found to be most helpful in terms of uh you know helping out your family right because what what can what have you been able to do that's eased the burden on uh, your daughter and your son-in-law and your grandchildren you know every grandchild is unique as you mentioned and, and they're all uh they all have different needs you know for me it's just being a grandmother um i do what all grandmothers do i you know babysit i transport this morning um the older was spent the night with us. We had a great snuggly party last night, and I picked, uh, dropped one off and picked up Jacob, and we went to GG's for Special Olympics and literacy, and then I'm here. So, you know, you just do what grandparents do. I try to help Jessica with, um, like the first six months or so, we provided um, a cleaning service, you know, because I think those are the things that, that do help. Um, you know, I, we... Um, try to encourage them to go out and have time on their own as much as possible because then we get the kids and we're excited that's it's a win-win <laughs> for us but i think um just being there is the main the main piece uh, having being used as a sounding board and i know that sometimes it's hard for for your mother to be your sounding board but um she and i fortunately have been close enough that she can do that um, i know she does it with some other great support friends too 
Um, and Mads uh, has been ama amazing to have that support um, for her. But yeah, I, I just, I just am a grandmother. That's mm. that's what I do. <laughs> hey, uh, so Caitlin, I have a question for you, because you're so independent. You have three jobs. You're a competitive cheerleader. What? Uh, how do you get around? So how do you get around town? How do you get from your home, your apartment? to your jobs, to your cheerleading, what's that like? For a cheer competitor, um, I, I get trophies if you, if you win. We, we won last week and we got first place. Nice. And, and for um, home and work for transportation, yeah. I take transit solution if Down syndrome use um, transit solution to different work and work options. Um, so you're able to use that to get there when you need to get there. Yeah. And Sadler, how about you? How do you get around? Well, several ways, actually. Uh, my favorite way is coming up in a few months. I love on my bike. Nice. Pretty much anywhere. And I get around with uh, like cab systems, like Union Cab. I get around with Van Gogh. I actually have in my house heard of Iris and Family Care. That's kind of came in uh, just this past year, and well, over a year ago actually, I believe it was. And uh, that's that for me was a change because I used to have the services that Caitlin had. But then I, after that, I had Van Gogh, and I like, for me, I, I'm i kind of like my father when it comes to being a little bit clumsy, especially on ice <laughs> and snow. So I have rides that are putting me up, uh, going to and from work and whatever place I need to get to, because I'm pretty active in pretty much anything I do. Because I also love the meditation as well. Uh, I also get around with family that they can uh, ask for I even got a, an offer of right home today from Bill and the president of DJs. <laughs> and so it sounds like you guys get around just fine. Uh, yeah, I do. And so then, I, Carolyn, since Isabella is 16, I have to ask you whether she's expressed interest in driving uh, and kind of how you guys have decided to handle that. Yes, she has. She intends to drive and get her Mini Cooper as soon as possible. <laughs> I should not drive. Um, you, you know, we have talked to Isabella. She has three older siblings who drive and all have their own cars. Um, and she understands that, which well, she doesn't understand. She hears us tell her that until she can make quick enough decisions that is not an option at the present moment and um I, my brother who has a cognitive disability he he lives in illinois and he went through a program where he started taking drivers at it like 18 and a half and and it was a year-long program that he was in i have to ask my mom more specifics but you, i mean our our decision for isabella is when we believe if we believe that you can get to this point and make good decisions because it's not your safety on the road that we're so I mean but there's all the other people driving on the road I strongly agree I actually have not done this for me in Alabama and my wife car which is always a teenage dream so I'm not I'm not sure she'll ever you know be able to drive I just don't know yeah and I know I've heard actually lately about a lot of people falling asleep on the wheel Yes, I have. Thank God my dad is there to go for me. <laughs> and something I often think about, Carolyn, and I'd be interested if, and maybe you've already answered it with your uh, what you were just talking about there, but I think we always strive to tell our kids that they can do absolutely anything, and certainly anything that their typically developing peers can do, but I think with driving, I think we often think of it as much more of a safety issue. So kind of how have you navigated the distinction there without making it sound like Isabella can't do something she wants to do right we we haven't told her no but you're right you spend your entire first 
15, 16 years saying, you can do it. You're just like everyone else. Might take you longer, but you'll get there. And and then when you have to when you have to backpedal on this, it's we I we have not said to her, Isabella, you will not drive because I can't really determine that right now. Will she drive? I'm not sure. Do we tell her, Isabella, can you make a split decision? Yeah, mom, it's easy. I watch you. Well, sure, it looks easy, but she does have older siblings who will say to her, her son or her brother, I mean Elijah, who you know thought everything looked easy, and then he got behind the wheel. He's like, "Whoa, there's a lot to pay attention to. Well, there's actually cars in front of you and behind you, to the left of you and to the right." That was hard, even by yeah. myself, because I actually have ADHD. It wasn't even hard when you're behind the wheel, having down and down and ADHD. Right. So I, you know, again, we just we just let her know that. We'll cross that bridge when we get there, but right now, this is, you know, not an option for you. So, uh, oh, you have a question? Yeah. I do. Can I go back to your question? <coughs> As a parent, um, the one-year-old didn't know this diagnosis was coming at all, and to think about planning for the future, like, well, on top of the fact that uh, for everything else, I have no idea what to do about guardianship. So I will I'll I will say that I've I have a three year old and we still haven't finished the process. I'm somewhat ashamed to say but also like willing to say because it's just so daunting and so intimidating. And I mean like I've I've went to law school and I have no idea how to navigate some of this stuff. Uh, so what I've found is that we've we found people that we trust that can help us with that. Uh, and you know, I'm happy to share some of those contacts with you. We have working with some wonderful people that we've uh, made contacts with. And then again, just keep an eye out for uh, the Love Dane program is going to be a great resource, and mm -hmm. the Mads program that's going to be coming up uh, later this year. And I think that's the best place to start is just try to get the information. I would stress that you, while it's it's really important to do it, I don't I don't think it's a whole. It doesn't. It's not very productive to put a lot of pressure on yourself that makes you kind of freeze up, right? So try and get help. Try and ask people. That's what worked for me. Sorry. Can I, can I you that? Yeah. So I, when I found out, I, my daughter was in utero, and I was obsessing over every single thing that could be happening to her. And I read all the medical stuff, and as soon as she came out, I was on the internet trying to think. Okay, well, I've got like she could get Alzheimer's at 35, and she was just like five months old. So I had a friend. <laughs> Live in the moment. Live, I mean, li literally, live in the moment. Enjoy her. You know, she's only one once. And there are people who will help you navigate this. If you if you get involved with family support, they will they will walk you through it. So yeah, and I know because I'm about to walk through it. So just breathe. Don't yeah. Don't get too anxious about those. If, Thanks. So I feel like this is, oh, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. Like, it, it's fine. You're going to be fine. Just please don't wait until you're like 75. <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and, and I think that the more you can get involved with groups like Love Dane, um, and and Mads and Gigi's, the more resources you can bring into your family, like grab them, just grab hold of them because there's so many people out there that will help you. You know, we found we were in a situation of crisis. You know, I didn't even have time to grieve my father's death because I had to get to work, and and I had two years then before my mother passed. So it was boom, boom, boom. You know. So don't do that to yourself, don't do that to your family, but you have plenty of time. And there's so, once I found the right person to call, 
it all just kind of came together. But it would have just been so much nicer if they could have helped me a little bit. <coughs> so, um, so it'll be okay. Um, but there's so many resources, and that's why Madison is so great because it's a small community, um, and Wisconsin is a great you know area. There's so many parents and, and family members that will just step you through it all. I think this was an awesome natural transition point to something I always like to ask uh, and discuss is kind of what, as, as caregivers, but also as our individuals with Down syndrome on the panel, what do you do in terms of self-care to kind of relieve the daily stresses that come along with, uh, you know, having uh, the, the responsibilities that we have? I mean, I, I'm a big movie guy. I like to sit down and watch a movie. I like to play golf. Uh, you know, just stuff that I used to do before Kennedy was born that I just try to focus a little bit more on now. So I'd be interested. Anyone who wants to take that one, uh, let us know what you think. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Um, but my situation is a little different because I, I do live with Chris, and so... Um, I have I have a lot less time for myself. Um, I've turned into a, a mother again um, at the age of fifty, and um, so things that I liked to do before when I lived in Colorado are out the window. Um, but what I do for myself when I can is I work out. Um, I used to go to the gym for two hours. I can't do that anymore, um, and I've lost that. It it just can't happen. So now I work out at home. Um, so it's making changes like that, um, but self-care is it's it's it can be really really hard for caregivers. Um, in all honesty, it's I guess I guess it's finding support, finding you know I'm I'm fortunate I have a husband who's living who's with us and <laughs> hasn't hasn't left <laughs> hasn't left me yet. Um, <laughs> And so he'll take Chris for a break, mm -hmm. so I can have a break now and then. But self care is is usually at the bottom of the list. Yeah, I and I I find that the thing that's helped me most is I just I've just started asking people unabashedly to spend some time with Kay or to come and help me out, and uh, more so than I ever thought I would, and just not being you know embarrassed by it or upset by it. I I think respite resources are a good plan. I also think, though, and coming from a parent's perspective, and note that I have six kids, you know, as parents, I, I take that role of sacrificial love pretty importantly. And, you know, you're devoted to your kids and your family. So when you walk in there, and yes, I didn't expect a diagnosis of Down syndrome either. For those of you, some of you may have known, and some of you may not have. but. You know, I, I, I do firmly believe that God gave you the child that a, you needed to have and that child needed to have as a parent. So I think you have to remember to always take care of yourself, but also remember that there's sacrificial love and just how important that is. And um, to remember to make time for yourself, your spouse, your other children, if you have some. And, but also remember that they were given to you for a reason, so, you know, embrace it and walk through it. The good times and the bad. There's, there's, you know, there's always good times and there's, there's some pretty awful ones too. When Isabella had infantile spasms, I thought it was pretty awful, you know, but you just get through it. And I think as they get older, it's more important to have respite as they get older. It, I think when they're young, no offense to all you young parents, all you parents with young children, but it, it is a little, in my opinion, unless you're having a lot of medical things, there it's a little easier, and people are a little more willing to take them. I think sometimes when they get older, it gets more difficult, and so you just have to find ways that you can in the community or things that they can go to that will allow you some time, and get enough sleep. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> Sleep's essential. So Sadler and Caitlin, how do you guys unwind after a stressful day at the office? Meditation. Oh. And I love the gym, especially a, a paper bag. Nice. Actually. <laughs> Caitlin, what do you like to do in your free time to unwind? 
Go to Las Vegas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I like to, I like to, to gamble because I like to win money. <laughs> uh, I also like to actually take care of my nephews. I got two young, really ambitious nephews. <laughs> and I actually had permission from both my brother and my sister to take them by myself. And not many people with a, dancing, with a dancing gun to actually take care of a kid out of their sobriety. Can you ever thought of that? Of having an, for an uncle or an aunt that has a disability and they take care of their nephew or their niece. It's like showing them when they get older, when they get into the world clicks they are, because there are so many different clicks. They should be the ones not to bully people with disabilities, but they should be the ones to stop the bullying. Mm -hmm. well. I gotta say something. I have respite too. Uh, I do arrows and Catholic charities because Catholic charities is someone will help me with some chores and <laughs> something like I do at home sometimes, but. Um, peer mentor or supporters will help me to do tasks at home with me. If they need, they told me, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And then if you need some help, they can, they ask me, do you want help? I said, yes, please. If you don't help, I can do my own. Like I'm gonna do my independent living skills. Like when Sandra does too, but if I have more support, like 20 hours with support workers with me, and I get more higher chores I do, and then when I do even racing bars way up high here, I can go to, I like to do social stuff outside of my apartment. I like to go to zoo the Venusu, and and also when Joe will t to say something for me, because I know Joe um, weeks with my mom because my mom helps me with me when she say get up in the morning. It's really hard for me to wake up, but I, I know that and. When Caroline said um, the timesheets for Repsit, uh, Repsit had timesheets for, they have grids on the timesheets. They were marked on the grid when you have um, more times to fit in in my work schedule and when you have more many times in your future when you have um, more building task in for in my I'm gonna share my heart because um, my mom gives me so many times to wake me up in the morning when she said, my mom is Tori over there. Because Rhonda, I know her because I know Jeremy and Kita and Annie. So we are unfortunately out of time for today and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I can't think of a better way to end it than with our two self-advocates here. And let's give our whole panel a big round of applause. Thank you, everybody.